Peter Heed in the 16th century would have been little more than a handful of homes, fisher cottages upon a rough shore, battered by the North Sea gales and essentially cut off from the rest of the country. With few boats and even fewer prospects, a lower quality of life whereby the population worked the sea, scavenged the rocks and lived in relative peace. Much of what we know of Peterhead had not yet been built. The land surrounding were wild, heather moors, all under the control of the monks of Deer and their little church. But for how much longer? The Reformation was on the horizon. A political and religious change was on the precipice. Further south, there dwelled a family with a keen eye on proceedings. The entire country was in uproar. The followers of John Knox had had their eyes opened to the deceptions of the Church of Rome, and soon the church lands would be forfeit to the crown. However, one William Keith sought to stretch his clutching fingers towards the spoils. The Keiths, from their fortress of Donodder, were intent on taking ownership of as much lands as they could get their hands on. The last abbot of Deer had died, so William Keith, 4th Earl Marshal, had his 15-year-old son, Robert, attain the post of postulant abbot in commendum. The first step in securing the rents into the coffers of the Nodder. Robert was a staunch Roman Catholic, but in studying the political atmosphere surrounding the Reformation, he concocted a sinister plan. He would pretend to embrace the changes with open arms and surrender the lands of Deer to King James, under the one condition, having no legitimate heir himself, the land succession would be passed to his nephew, George who would become the 5th Earl Marshal. An audience was sought with the recht excellent recht high and mechty Lord King James VI. The situation explained, and James, having no religious scruples and less moral sense, keen to keep his good friend George in good standing, agreed. So, the unholy bargain to rob the church of its lands was concluded. On the 7th of July, 1587, a petition, known as a Procutory of Resignation of the Lands of Deer in favour of Robert, Commendator of Deer, and George E. Marshall, was executed. And to give an air of legality to the brazen piece of effrontery, two destitute monks of Deer were resurrected from the Tomb of Oblivion to add their signatures to the document. All was in place for the temporal lordship to be passed. The Lords of Parliament, however, were not keen to pass the legislation, King James being well known to anoint such honours for his own benefit. He was always on the brink of poverty, and was so easily influenced by a bag of shiny coins. Parliament wished to put a stop to temporal lordships, but in an age when chivalry had lost its splendour, and when bribery and chicanery and downright falsehood characterised the calculating opportunists of the Scottish nobility, terms were eventually met. So in Parliament on 29th of July 1587, among the first terms on the agenda was the signing of the Charter, creating the temporal lordship of Altry and erecting the lands of Keithinch, alias Peterhead, into a borough of barony. Immediately after, an act was passed annexing all unappropriated church lands to the crown, with the exception of those under temporal lordships. Clan Keith had won the race by a head, had secured rightful ownership of the lands, and had cemented themselves as the superiors of Peterhead. Robert Keith, having gained momentous powers over the land, did nothing. He died happy that the lands of Deer had been secured for the family of Keith. Succeeded by George, the first feudal baron of Peterhead, he lost no time in bringing the powers and privileges of the Charter into operation. 
The greed which had tainted the whole house of Keith urged him to do so. Although he had inherited huge wealth from the death of his father William, he had frittered it away with sumptuous living and reckless extravagance. He had extended and practically rebuilt the castle of Inveryuki and surrounded himself with baronial pomp, and had even built a new castle on Keith Inch itself. The castle of Keith Inch was an exact reproduction of the Danish king's palace. His must have been a lowly habitation for a royal prince. The castle of the Ness of Keith Inch consisted chiefly of a round tower with a flat roof, surmounted by a flagstaff. The tower rose abruptly from the sea at the southwest corner of the island, where once occupied the Peterhead Barrel Factory some years later. It served as a place of departure or arrival by the sea. With a favourable wind, the Earl Marshal of 300 years ago could go by sea from Peterhead to Donotar Castle in much less time than he could do by land, and the journey would be both cheaper and safer. After 1715, the castle naturally fell into disuse and for a time was completely neglected. It ended its life being used as a fish house, a gunpowder magazine for the batteries, among other things, until the decayed old building was eventually demolished in 1813. George Keith, whose coffers were beginning to become drained, having founded Marshall College in Aberdeen, and of all the financial obligations associated with that, his exchequer was at a low ebb. So it was to Peter Hayde he would look for the restoration of his family fortune. He decided to sell various plots of land to the fisherfolk in the hope that they themselves would band together and build a harbour to attract more fisherfolk to the vicinity. The Earl, however, realised that before a harbour could be built and a town developed, it was essential to give a little encouragement to the fisherfolk. They must become a community possessing individual civil and communal rights so that they would work and labour for the betterment of themselves and incidentally of their overlord. A few names signed up to the scheme and before long a great excitement had erupted within the Fisher Toon. A few contract was written up between the Earl and the Fourteen Households. John Davidson, Willem Hay, Gilbert Darg, James Walker, Gilbert Bodie, Willem Bodie, Elspeth Nicholson, Andrew Gray, Willem Ritchie Sr., Willem Ritchie Younger, Hercules McFerlin, William Allen, James Smith, and Willem Muir. The few contract was signed in Aberdeen on the 1st of June 1593. Only Willem Bodie and Andrew Gray were sufficiently versed in the calligraphy as to subscribe to the contract by their own hand. Six others signed with their hand at the pen, and in the end, six declined to sign at all. Perhaps they realised the full terms of contract and didn't quite fancy being bound to provide personal services to the Earl. However, that first day of June 1593 was in no doubt a red letter day in Peterhead, at the great exodus to Aberdeen and every detail of the great signing of what was to be the most important document in the history of Peterhead, and of the entertainment provided by the Earl Marshal on that day must have been handed down from generation to generation. From the erection of the town into a borough of barony until nearly the middle of the 17th century, little records are available to throw a glimmer of light on civic affairs. No minute book was kept, the verbal command of the Earl Marshal, or of his Baron Bailey, was beyond argument, discussion or dispute. Matters then engaging the attention of the Toon Council were confined, no doubt, to the payment of harbour dues, market dues, petty squabbles relative to the peat mosses, the upkeep of the church and school. Scotland was then passing through troublous times, the days of the pillory, the gibbet, and the burning of witches. It is difficult for us to comprehend the miserable superstitions which clogged the minds of our Scottish forefathers 
three or four hundred years ago. How men could have so resolutely shut their eyes to common sense and receive the absurd and ridiculous superstitions which changed them from sober, God-fearing churchgoers to religious fanatics and made them resort to practices of extreme cruelty. In the year 1615, the Scottish Parliament appointed a committee to inquire into the depositions of no fewer than 54 witches and to grant to trial and execution of those persons accused. So recently as 1722, an old woman was burned in Sutherlandshire for this imaginary crime. We must therefore suppose that Peter Heed had its warlock hunting and witch burning like any other superstitious Scottish borough of the age. One would naturally assume Peter Head at one time would have indeed been a very superstitious place, full of fishermen and farmers, those whose emotions fly high and whose livelihoods depend upon forces which they cannot control. Tradition has preserved the name of one warlock whom the town honoured by burning. He was called Sandy Hay and resided in the Langade. He was a blacksmith by trade but was so accused by a neighbour. Sandy, a man of considerable humour which he could not help indulging in, even when in danger of the stake. When asked by the clergyman why he had laughed so hard one day in church, he replied in saying that he had seen the ghost of old Nick sitting in the corner of the highest gallery, taking note of a' the names o' a' the folk asleep in the pews. At the increase of the drowsy worshippers, his parchment was too smart to contain a' the names, so he tried to stretch a paper out with his teeth, but he lost the hood and knocked his heed with such a devilish thump against the wa in him. Nothing more was wanted to confirm his guilt. He was immediately brought before the horrified Kirk session and hence hurried to the fire. He was burned at the stake in the centre of the washing house green, for it is said all the parish's witches and warlocks were burned. Here can be recited a small section of a poem entitled The Burning of Sandy Hay, which was published in 1883. Twas on a simmer Sunday noon when folks were met for prayer to hear the word in yon all kirk, new roofless ruined and bare. New Sandy Hay was there that day, fun twinkling in his een, a listen how the sleeper snored, throng watching a the scene, till something happened, I ken a what, mere funny yet than a, brock Sandy's mirth to sick a pitch, he gee a loud guffaw. The kirk had shalt, the folks were free to breathe fresh air again, but Beadle Tom took Sandy Hay back to the kirk amain to answer where he did lach before the session ah, why he dared such sacrilege as gee the lewd giffa. Weel, sirs, who he we solemn face, I'm sure as we are here, the thing I saw that made me lach will gar ye swarf with fear. The psalms were sung, the text gin out, the sun glass new turned over. We are at once, I saw a deal, guy strayed in doon a fleer, and up the poopit stair he fit, and troch I get a flag, when to the soon board tap he sprang, and sat on its straight leg, a parchment and a claw he gripped, the other hilt a pen, he write a list o a that slept unseen to mortal ken. But mortal folks will make mistakes and even say the deal. His parchment proved our smart a hood, their names for I skeel. Just for a wee he scratched his pow and shook his horns with rage, then seized the scroll with tusks and claws to stretch the scanty page. He took nae time to try its strength, but pooed with mech and mane, when we a scrunch the parchment tore, say furious was his strain. But with the jerk he balance lost, his heed banked against the wa. Say I forgot it was the kirk, and gee the lewd guffaw. The session heard his tale throughout, with faces fight with terror. 
the rain upturned and hands outspread in speechless fear and horror. Then it was saddled among them there, before they did adjourn, that on the morn pure Sandy Hay should us a warlock burn. The 17th century witnessed the union of the crowns, the issue of the authorised version of the Bible, and the signing of the National Covenant. The fierce quarrels between the Stuart kings and Parliament relative to civil and religious liberties also came to a head with disastrous results. Charles I lost his head, and the last of the Stuart kings, James II, only saved his by sacrificing his throne. Bitter animosities were awakened throughout the land, and ripples from the royal pool eddied to the shores of Peterhead. It was killing time, and the affairs of local government and town development paled into insignificance before the greater and more robust quarrels of a nation. In 1644, some 500 of Cromwell's English soldiers were encamped at Keithinch, with their headquarters within the castle. And the officer commanding, with strict Puritan rectitude, immediately instituted a reign of terror in the Fisher Toon. These Puritan hypocrites peered and pried into the most intimate details of family and communal life, and daily some unfortunate wretch was condemned, in the name of Christianity, to the pillory or jogues for some trivial sin, actual or prospective. Soon, however, the psychological fear of torture and moral humiliation at the decree of the Puritans was superseded by a more paralysing terror of sudden death. In 1645 came the plague. Ship-borne, flea-carrying black rats from the Far East had somehow entered the port, and the pestilence, known as the bubonic plague, swept through the town. Men, women and children, in perfect health today, were dead tomorrow. More ruthless than any army, the disease attacked with speedy, persistent and exorable similarity. Boils, blains, carbuncles, delirium, vomiting of blood and agonising death. There was no medicine, no skill and no knowledge. Ignorant superstition prevailed and with philosophical resignation the plague was accepted as a divine visitation on a sinful people. In that dark age of medical science, impotent humanity wept and prayed, then died. Tradition says that the first victim of the plague was a domestic servant in the employment of Robert Walker, who lived in Chapel Street, then a country lane. Hysterical fear at the presumed wrath of God roused the inhabitants to remove the plague-stricken from their mist. There were no hospitals, so the first victims were indiscriminately dumped in the toll booth to lie and die and rot. Funnily enough, the plague showed no prejudice. The holy Puritans died as hideously and as swiftly as the sinful inhabitants. Necessity being the mother of invention, the first hospital in Peterhead was hurriedly built and consisted of eight wooden huts erected in the northmost corner of Ive Park. All who entered that hospital were doomed. The driver of the plague cart had no return tickets, and the six feet wide trenches which were dug in the immediate vicinity of the huts yawned and engulfed each victim with insatiable maw. Still, the plague raged on, when at last, out of pure desperation, came a glimmering of common sense to the town's fathers. The toll booth, with its gruesome contents, was burned to the ground. This action gave rise to a rumour that the plague huts were pulled down upon the living and the dead, set on fire and deserted, remaining isolated until 1755. The plague lasted six weeks, 
and over that time over 300 people died. But happy to relate, many of the victims were soldiers of Cromwell. The dramatic loss of population slowed the development of the town. Many men had lost faith in themselves, and their simple minds could not reconcile their sudden bereavements, sufferings and hardships. In 1688, when James II fled to the loving arms of Louis XIV to save his own neck, there followed the age of glorious revolution. Throughout the land it was a period of an intense diplomatic activity, conspiracy plots and intrigue to re-establish the House of Stuart on the throne of England. Jacobite swords rattled in their scabbards, and dirks itched to drink blood. Although on the whole, the inhabitants of Peterhead remained passive and composed, and gave little heed to the political issues involved, soon malcontents had public opinion inflamed to such a pitch that street riots became a part of everyday life. In 1711, the town got so out of control that William Earl Marshall issued a commission commanding and requiring all of the inhabitants to give due respect, obedience and assistance to the Baileys in maintaining law and order, under the threat of dire penalties. William died in 1713 and his son George Keith, 10th Earl Marshal, took his place. George had been appointed Captain of the Guards by Queen Anne in 1712, fought with distinction in Marlborough, winning by his courage and initiative, and subsequently became Colonel of the House Guards, which he commanded until the death of Queen Anne in 1714. When that event took place, George, who had always been sympathetic to the House of Stuart, wished to proclaim the pretender King of England at the head of his troops, and intended to carry his army of men with him. But he hesitated, and the moment of opportunity passed. George hurriedly travelled north to assist the Earl of Mar in his preparations for insurrection. He wrote to James, son of James II who had fled to France, begging him to come over to Scotland to take part in the struggle. A sovereign deprived of his rights, he wrote ought to share the perils of those who expose their lives to restore them to him. At York, on the way back north, George met his younger brother James, whereupon he decided to stand or fall by the pretender and return with George to Scotland. Arriving in Aberdeen, they were met by the Earl of Mar, and on the 20th of September 1715, at the Merket Cross, the Pretender was proclaimed King James VIII. The news that the Pretender had been proclaimed King in the place of the Elector of Hanover as George I soon reached the ears of the inhabitants of the Fisher Toon, and following the example of the Earl Marshal, they were aflame with patriotic fervour for the House of Stuart. On the 23rd of December, 1715, on the order of the Earl Marshal, the Pretender was proclaimed King at the Merket Cross of Peterhead by Baron Bailey Thomas Arbuthnet, amid scenes of the wildest enthusiasm. Having openly proclaimed themselves sympathetic to this Jacobite cause, the town fathers had to give serious consideration to the defence of the town. Establishing a company of the guard, consisting of 138 men and 10 women, carrying armour, sword and flintlock. In addition, eight old cannon salvaged from the St Michael in 1588 were mounted on the Tollbooth Green to protect it at all cost. So ardent were the inhabitants in the cause of the Pretender, not content with having him proclaimed King at Peterhead, twelve rode on horseback with sword and sufficient firelock to Fraserborough, where, in defiance of Lord Sultan, they made a similar proclamation at the Market Cross. Still not content, they entered the toll booth with Big Hammer and did break down the doors and rob from them 24 stand of new fire locks, charged with powder and balls, carrying them back to Peterhead for use by the general. Late 
on the Sunday night of 22nd of December, the old pretender arrived off Peterhead in a very small fishing bark with only two servants and a few gentlemen. Deeming it at first unsafe to land in the port, the little vessel well armed with its cargo of brandy crept along the shore and attempted to enter the River Yugi. But the night was wet and late the tide, so throwing all caution to the wind, they landed at the old pier at Port Henry. It was a cold, wild night of cold rain, and the reception extended to him by Baron Bailey was just as cold and not befitting a king. By then Arbuthnet had begun to entertain serious doubts as to the success of the cause. Against his own convictions, he had loyally followed the Earl Marshal, and had, in doing so, placed his life in jeopardy. Heads were bound to fall in the dust, and it was quite a natural desire that his should not. So he offered no warm-hearted hospitality to the pretender, whom he lodged overnight in the house in the long gate of his son-in-law, Captain Park. Park being at that time absent on duty. The next day, the morning of the 23rd of December, King James left the town on horseback. He rode along the long gate, past Buckenhaven, and so west to Inveryuki Castle, on a short visit to the widowed Lady Keith. Certain it is he passed the next night at Newborough, thus severing his connection with Buchan. Accompanied only by a handful of horsemen, in ill health and in disguise, he made his way slowly southward. He had come to retrieve the fallen fortunes of his house, but the night was wet and late the tide. As for the Jacobite rebellion, we know the bulk of them marched out and never returned. Sheriff Muir, where the young Keiths nobly sustained the untarnished honour of their ancient race, was fought and practically lost. The spineless, melancholy monarch inspired no confidence. Lacking moral courage, he was soon sailing surreptitiously from Montrose to the safe land of France, and from every disheartened Highland army, every one took the road that pleased him best. So the drama was played out to the bitter end, but the reckoning was still to pay. Immediately on the suppression of the rebellion of 1715, a new order of things was instituted in Peterhead. The Earl was attained, his estates were confiscated, and his life forfeited. Peterhead lost its superior, and Baron Bailey or Burnet, after hiding from the Redcoats for quite some time, was thankful only to lose his job. The crown became superior of the town until such a time in 1728, the lands of Peterhead were bought by the governors of the Merchant Maiden Hospital of Edinburgh, whom retained all powers, privileges and rights under the original few contract of 1593. If you're enjoying the content on the channel, make sure you like and subscribe and make sure you're following us on Facebook. In the next episode, we'll be looking at the harbour, the herring fleets, the whaling industry, the prison and the granite industry. We'll see you then.